Recorded live. Hello, this is William Fink, and this is Christiania Saturdays. Today is Saturday, May 10th, I think, 2014. Praise Yahweh, the God of Israel, and thank you for listening. Today is um, going to begin what will be at least a two-part series, probably three parts, on the non-Adamic races and eschatology. If we don't get this right, we can't get anything right. The things that I have to say tonight, I have already said many times before in similar contexts. I'm going to repeat many things that I've said before in, in my Friday night Bible studies, especially over these next couple of weeks. They have to be said. And, and hopefully tonight that they will all be put into, or, or beginning with tonight, they will all be put into one perspective. That's my, my, my objective in this series, or in this part of this explaining to seed line series. Some of the things I say tonight, I've already presented when I presented the Minor Prophets, Joel and Hosea, here a couple of years ago. Before we begin, we should define the Greek word ethnos, and that might be evident, become evident why we have to do this later in this program. In a large ninth edition of the, the Liddell and Scott Greek-English lexicon, an ethnos, which is, well, everybody here should realize that it's often translated as Gentile in the New Testament, right? And ethnos is usually properly translated as nation. In the Liddell and Scott lexicon, it is first a number of people living together. That's the primordial Greek definition of the word. A company, a body of men, and then of animals, it was used to denote swarms or flocks. After Homer, after the, um, the tragic poets, uh, I'm sorry, the epic poets, it was used to denote a nation or a people. However, the word was sometimes also used to describe a caste, an order, or a class within a particular nation. It was used that way. I recall it being used that way several times by Herodotus. It was also sometimes used of a single individual in relation to another individual, and in that context, we would use the term relative to describe that use of the word. Liddell and Scott supply examples and citations from Greek literature supporting all of these definitions. So the understanding of the word relies heavily on the context in which it is used. However, what is important to the biblical context is that nations are basically people groups. And the term can be used to describe people groups, whether those people groups are Adamic or not, or even of mixed races or of beasts. The definition of nation is not necessarily limited to the idea of a nation as we know it, which would commonly perhaps be defined as a people with a common culture, history, government, and genetic origin inhabiting a contiguous geographic region. Although the Greeks did use the term in that context, therefore, in the Greek language, Groups of non-Adamic peoples, sometimes pejoratively labeled as beasts in the Old Testament, they can also be called nations. In Hebrew, the word goy, Strong's number 1471, is also basically defined in Jesenius' Hebrew and Chaldee lexicon on pages 162 and 163, as a people properly 
a confluence of man. So we see in that definition a similarity to the basic Greek definition, which is simply a number of people living together. Gisenius noted that properly it would seem to mean body, corpus, from the root word geviah, Strong's number 1472, where goy is Strong's number 1471, Strong's number 1472, geviah, is a body or a corpse. And Gesenius stated that the idea of a goy, the idea of the body or corpse, was transferred to the idea of the body politic or the whole people. And that's also how Roman writers sometimes use the word corpus, which means a body. Gesenius points out that the word goy was used to describe both the Israelite nation and other nations of men. However, like the Greek usage, Gesenius also points out that the word was used to describe herds and troops of animals. And he cites Joel 1.6 and Zephaniah 2.14 as, an exam as, as examples. And comparing Proverbs chapter 30, verses 25 and 26, where the word goy doesn't appear, but the word am, and the word am in Hebrew is also a people, is compared with certain passages in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and passages from the poetry of Virgil, which use equivalent Greek and Latin terms in that same manner. While Strong's definition of the word goy, or nation, generally, is somewhat biased towards the definition which is insisted upon by the Jews, even Strong admits that a goy can describe a troop of animals or a flight of locusts. So we see that the word goy and the word ethnos can indeed be used to describe a number of beasts accompanied or, or accustomed to living together. And not only Adamic Genesis 10 nations in the biblical sense of the term. We should understand these definitions in the full manner in which these terms were used in the ancient world because there are deceivers who claim that such passages as those which we are about to quote from Jeremiah, well, they claim that these can only refer to Adamic nations and not to the so-called other races, which in the Bible are often referred to as beasts. That is not the case. We have shown that the words which we often translate as nation from Hebrew and Greek Hebrew and Greek, were indeed applied to collections of beasts as well as to collections of men. Of course, the same deceivers would attempt to change beasts and half-beasts into men in, the re in relation to the promises found in the New Testament. However, that is certainly not possible. With this, we will read Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. From her seven. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith Yahweh of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve Yahweh their God and David their king. So this time of Jacob's trouble, strangers are serving themselves of Jacob. And we're going to repeat this next week, also this particular passage. But they, meaning Jacob, shall serve Yahweh their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore fear not, O my servant Jacob, saith Yahweh, neither be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar, 
and thy seed from the land of their captivity. It should never be forgotten that Jacob is writing after most of Israel and Judah had been deported by the Assyrians. And Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be in quiet and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith Yahweh, to save thee. Now he's talking about saving Jacob from afar and his seed from the land of their captivity. And he says, Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Where has Israel not been scattered since the Assyrian deportations, which began in 720 B.C.? Here Yahweh is talking about places afar off from where he would save Israel, and he promises to make a full end of all the other nations or people groups, and we see the word can apply to people groups of men or people groups of beasts. Yahweh would make a full end of all the other nations where Israel was scattered. Likewise, concerning the children of Israel, who, when Jeremiah had written, were rather recently dispersed, but they were already, already taken out of Palestine. We read in Jeremiah chapter 46, in verse 27, But fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and be in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. Fear thou not, O Jacob my servant, saith Yahweh, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all the nations where I have driven thee. But I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure, yet I will not leave thee wholly unpunished. The same language that we see in Jeremiah chapter 30. And we must ask again, historically, where have the children of Israel not been scattered ever since the Assyrian deportations, which began approximately 740 B.C., 721 B.C., more precisely? The children of Israel have been scattered around the entire globe. Therefore, if we believe these promises, we must realize that the children of Israel have no choice but to keep themselves distinct from all of the aliens which they encounter regardless of where they travel in the earth. You wouldn't be, want to be caught up in Yahweh's making a full end of all those other peoples as he has promised. Yahweh God divided the nations, as it states in Deuteronomy 32.8, which Paul also cites in Acts chapter 17. And Deuteronomy 32.8 states, When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, so these nations are distinguished as the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel, for Yahweh's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. When Yahweh scattered Israel, Yahweh made a full end of all those Adamic, old Adamic Genesis 10 nations where Israel was also scattered to. They were all either eventually destroyed by other races, the other so-called races, the invading races, the flood from the mouth of the serpent, and we will get into much more detail on that next week. And that flood from the mouth of the serpent would also persecute the children of Israel. And if they weren't destroyed by the other races, they were absorbed into the Israelite tribes of the dispersions. The Germanic tribes, which eventually came to dominate and then subsume 
the other tribes of Europe. However, the prophecies in Jeremiah concerning the full end of all the nations where Israel was scattered are not limited to the Adamic Genesis 10 nations because, as we have already seen here in the definitions of the words for nation in Hebrew and Greek, those terms were used for groups of beasts as well as for groups of men. And it is historically obvious that the scattering of Israel went far beyond the boundaries of the original Adamic lands. Israel was scattered among the so-called beast nations as well as the Adamic nations. That is not to say that Yahweh created the beast nations. There is no record whatsoever that he did so. And as we also demonstrated from the words of Christ in the last segment of this series, the eschatology of the Bible refutes the idea that Yahweh created non-Adamic people. As we shall see again later on in this series, not tonight, we won't get to it tonight, but we will in the coming weeks. Rather, they are beast nations because they are hominids which have not the spirit of Yahweh which separates men from beasts. It's not only our genetic structure which separates us from the beast, it's that spirit which Yahweh God imparted to the Adamic man within that genetic structure that separates the men from the beasts. Without it, as the scripture also attests, without that Adamic spirit, even men are little but beasts. It's the Adamic spirit which separates us. Therefore, the other races being nameless in scripture, the non-Adamic nations are pejoratively called beasts because they have no name in Scripture. Initially, the children of Israel were taken captive to Assyria and to Babylon. By the time Jeremiah wrote his prophecy where Yahweh said that, I will make a full end of all the nations where I have scattered thee, Assyria had already been destroyed by the Scythians and the Medes, the Scythians actually being. Israel in the deportations. This is assured because Jeremiah writes of the book of Nezar around the same time, and the book of Nezar did not rule Babylon and begin to build his own empire until after the destruction of Assyria. Assyria was destroyed in 612 BC, and the book of Nezar ascended to the throne of Babylon in 605 BC. Where are Assyria and Babylon today? They're gone already. They were gone by 540 B.C. Babylon was destroyed by the Persians. Their lands today, however, their lands are inhabited with devils, with jackals, and with unclean birds. That's what the scripture told us would inhabit those lands, and we discussed that at length in the last segment of this two seed line series, part 18, two weeks ago. Assyria and Babylon are a place for beasts to lie down in. From Zephaniah chapter 2, from verse 13, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. The Scythians were the primary vessel by which that was done, the dispersion of Israel in company with the Medes and the Persians and some other peoples. And will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness. And flocks shall lie down in the midst of her. All the beasts of the nations, both the cormorant and the bittern, shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. The cormorant and the bittern are the beasts of the nations. Do you think that they're really birds? Or are they the unclean birds of Revelation 18, which make their homes in the branches of the tree of mystery Babylon, which is pertinent to this current age? These are allegories for people. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. 
This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly. It said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How she has become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in. Everyone that passes by her shall hiss and wag his hand. Or maybe the dogs will wag their tails. This is representative of other prophecies concerning not only Assyria, there are similar prophecies against all the other nations of the old Adamic world of the Near and Middle East. Examining this, we should see what God thinks about Arabs. Because it is Arabs who are inhabiting those lands today. As we also had discussed in the prior segments of this series, the once white nations of Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sheba are also gone. As Yahweh said in Isaiah chapter 43, he gave them up for the children of Israel. Who did he give them up to? By realizing that, we see what God thinks about Negroes, because it was the black Nubians which had invaded and eventually caused the desolation of those once great white civilizations. Therefore, black Nubians and the other mixed-race Arabs who inherited those lands must be who Yahweh had given those nations up to. Eventually, all of these lands of the East were occupied by groups of mingled peoples descended from Adamic race mixers of the other Genesis 10 nations along with Nubians, people from the other Negro tribes, people from the Turks, people from the Mongols, the Turks and the Mongols both later and later, later conquered and occupied all of those same areas. Yahweh thinks that they're all satyrs, devils, cormorants, unclean birds, demons, jackals. That's the language. He says those people that inhabit those areas, he, he calls them after those terms. If those people are not the satyrs, the demons, the jackals, the, the, the cormorants, the other unclean birds, the devils, if those people that we see there today inhabiting those lands are not those things, then the scripture is not true. But the scripture is true. Those aren't people. Those are devils. Those are unclean birds. Those are jackals. Those are cormorants. Those are satyrs. Those are lilith. <laughs> that collectively, they all came from Satan. Collectively, they are a part of the satanic entity. They're the flood from the serpent's mouth to a great degree. They're not the whole flood, but they're a pretty large part of it. With this in mind, we should read from Isaiah chapter 56. I'm going to read practically the entire chapter. It must be noted that the first 40 chapters of Isaiah primarily concern Israel before the end of the kingdom, the final end of the kingdom, the destruction of ancient Israel and Judah, and also the destruction of those who destroyed them in addition to the promised salvation of Israel and Judah. With this, I am going to repeat much of what I said concerning Isaiah chapter 56 in the commentary on Hosea presented here over two years ago. The, last, the entire last 26 chapters of Isaiah are written to the children of Israel as if they were already in the dispersion. It's written to the Isles of the West. Indeed, Isaiah was writing those chapters as the children of Israel had gone off into Assyrian captivity. And many of the children of Israel had left to inhabit the coastlands of the West even long before that. The Romans, the Dorian Greeks, the Phoenicians. The context is clear throughout these chapters that they apply only to the dispersed children of Israel. In order to um, 
understand the context of Isaiah chapter 56 in order to understand who that message is meant for, we will first read Isaiah chapter 54, verses 4 through 8. And let me say that all the chapters leading up to Isaiah chapter 54 are basically a messianic prophecy. So we have one long messianic prophecy that spans several chapters. Then we get into Isaiah chapter 54, and, and then there's a message for Israel in their dispersion. From verse 4, Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth. Israel forgot who they were totally in their dispersions. And shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. The children of Israel sinned in their national youth. And therefore Yahweh their husband put them out, making them as if they were widows. And indeed they were when he died on the cross. For thy maker is thine husband. Yahweh of hosts is his name. And thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. As soon as Israel consumes the whole earth. For Yahweh has called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth. When thou wast refused, saith thy God. And this describes Israel having been put away and looks forward to a reconciliation. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee, meaning Israel and nobody else. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, and that was a 750-year moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith Yahweh thy Redeemer. Now the Universalists love to twist the verses of Isaiah out of context, but this is the context. They can only apply to the very same children of Israel who were cast off from the polity of the ancient kingdom of God. And with this, we will read Isaiah chapter 56. Thus saith Yahweh, keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that does this, and the son of man that lays hold on it. And keep it the Sabbath from polluting it, and keep it his hand from doing any evil. And this does not admit outsiders. Rather, those outcasts of Israel who sought to continue in the commandments of God would be blessed. That's what this is telling us, which is the natural result of keeping his commandments, his blessing. This can include only Israel because nobody else was even cognizant of the laws and Sabbaths which were required by God only of Israel. Isaiah's writing of Israel's dispersion, 720 B.C. Only Israel was cognizant of the laws of God. Yahweh was only the God of Israel. These words are only relevant to the children of Israel. Psalm 78.5, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children. Psalm 105, verse 6, O ye seed of Abraham his servant, ye children of Jacob his chosen, he is Yahweh our God, his judgments are in all the earth, he has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham, and his oath unto Isaac. And he confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. The usual verse we cite in reference to only Israel having the law, Psalm 147, 19 and 20. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He has not dealt so with any nation. As for his judgments, 
they have not known them. Praise ye Yahweh. So who could be the people who would keep Yahweh's Sabbath and commandments in Isaiah 56, 1 and 2? Nobody else but Israel, as the references in the Psalms just quoted fully demonstrate. Nobody else but Israel could have possibly sought to keep the Sabbaths and the laws of God. For that reason alone, references to those keeping them in Isaiah 56 must be references to the estranged, deported Israelites. The nation is put away for its iniquity, yet here there is a promise that Yahweh would provide for the individuals of that nation who did not practice that iniquity and rather sought his justice. Isaiah 56, 3. Neither let the son of the stranger that has joined himself to Yahweh speak, saying, Yahweh has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. The son of the stranger here represents the descendants of those same outcasts of Israel who were estranged by Yahweh, and therefore they were as good as strangers to Yahweh. While the nation was outcast, the individuals who kept his ways during that estrangement were here promised an ultimate reward. None of this can include the non-Israel so-called peoples, because Yahweh already separated non-Israel peoples a thousand years before this time at Mount Sinai. Here, those cast-off Israelites who would choose to keep his ways are reassured that they will not be separated from being counted among his people. The only way they could say that Yahweh has utterly separated me from his people is if they were his people in the first place. And therefore, the allegorical eunuchs who may have said this could only be of Israel. They were estranged, therefore they were figurative strangers and figurative eunuchs. That estrangement ended with the reconciliation of the cross of Christ. Among other places in the New Testament, this is fully evident in Paul's epistles in Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5, Galatians chapters 3 and 4, Ephesians chapter 2. I'm not going to read the passages tonight. I've actually read all the Romans passages the last two Fridays on Christogenia Internet Radio on Friday nights in our presentation of Romans. In all of those places and others, Paul was speaking to dispersed Israelites about their reconciliation to God through Christ. Isaiah chapter 56, verses 4 through 7. For thus saith Yahweh unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the strange, the sons of the stranger that join themselves unto Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh to be his servants. Everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And again, the stranger here is one who has been alienated from God since the context includes only the children of Israel, and only they ever had the laws, the commandments, the Sabbaths. A eunuch cannot have children. And Yahweh, forsaking the children of Israel, to him they became as if they were eunuchs. All of the Israelites of the captivity were sons and daughters of God. Yahweh said of Israel in Deuteronomy 14.1, 
Ye are the children of Yahweh your God. Here we see that if in the captivity any one of them remained in the covenant agreement with him to keep the laws and the Sabbaths, that they, being sons and daughters, would be given a reward greater than that of sons and daughters. These four passages here from Hosea illustrate that Israel became as a eunuch to Yahweh when the nation was cast off. And therefore, individual Israelites are the allegorical eunuchs of Isaiah 56. Each of these verses in Hosea is a promise of reconciliation between Yahweh and those very same children of Israel. Hosea 1.10, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass, and in the place where it was said to them, Ye are not my people. They were like eunuchs to him. There it shall be said to him, Ye are the sons of the living God. During the period of alienation from Yahweh, the children of Israel were not recognized as children. This is an allegory, and it is promised that nevertheless, one day it would be explained to those very same people that they are indeed his children. Hosea 2, verses 4 through 7. Speaking of deported Israel, and I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. For their mother played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers to give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. As Clifton likes to say, those thorns are the same Canaanite thorns that prevented the children of Israel from establishing a home again in Palestine. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but she shall not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband. That was done in Christ. For then it was better with me than now. And we see again a prophecy to estrangement, an unrecognition of the children, and then a promise of reconciliation. Hosea 3, verses 4 and 5. For if the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim, all these are the symbols of their national heritage. Afterward, shall the children of Israel return and seek Yahweh their God and David their king, and shall fear Yahweh and his goodness in later days. And again, we see a promise of the reconciliation of Israel to God. Paul explains that to be the purpose of his ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, he states, But all things from Yahweh, all things are made new. Well, Paul clarifies that because the other races aren't going to be made new. They're not from Yahweh. But all things from Yahweh, who has reconciled us to himself throughout, through Christ, and is the giving of the service of reconciliation to us. Paul knew that the nations which he went to that were the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he knew that his message was one of reconciliation between Israel and God. And nobody else is promised in the prophets, and as he explains throughout his epistles. Hosea 9.12, Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them. This is why, in their punishment, the children of Israel were eunuchs in the eyes of God. Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them, that there shall not be a man left, yet woe also to them when I depart from them. The children of Israel were as eunuchs to God until the promised reconciliation in Christ, of which Daniel 9.24 says that the coming Messiah 
that his purpose was to make reconciliation for iniquity. The Bible is a consistent book with a consistent message from cover to cover. Isaiah chapter 56 is not inconsistent with the rest of Scripture. It's entirely consistent once you understand the simple allegorical language. Isaiah 56 eight sums it all up. Yahweh God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, says, Yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. So we see that in Christ, God intends to gather nobody but the lost sheep, the outcasts of Israel, and that they had spread themselves far and wide. This verse alone should prove the assertions given here in the interpretations of all these verses of Isaiah chapter 56. Nobody else has ever promised this gathering to God except the outcasts of Israel. The gathering of others to him besides those which are gathered is still inclusive only of Israelites because Yahweh gathers the outcasts of Israel the children of Israel, even before the Assyrian deportations had come to colonize much of Europe by sea, all the way to the British Isles and the Scandinavian coasts, and probably many points even beyond there, which we don't have clear in our history. Now at the end of Isaiah chapter 56, we shall see a prophecy, basically a prophecy of universalism, which is being fulfilled throughout the white Christian nations at this very time, without a doubt. Isaiah 56, from verse 9, All ye beasts of the field, come to devour. Yeah, all ye beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down loving to slumber. Yeah, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain, from his quarter. Come ye, say. Come ye, they say. I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. The denominational sects think that there is profit in universalism, but there is only destruction. The beasts, which are invited by the blind watchmen of Israel, actually devour the flock of God. This passage in Isaiah must correspond to a similar prophecy in Joel. The prophecy of Joel is a dual prophecy, which is clear from the context throughout. In Joel chapter 3, it is evident that he did not write the prophecy until after the Assyrian deportations of most of Israel and Judah. And he's looking forward to the coming Babylonian invasions of Judah. Joel prophecies in a manner in which his words can be applied both to his own time and to the day of the Lord, which he places within the context of the later post-captivity days of Israel. Here is what Joel says in part in Joel chapter 1. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm has left has the locust eaten. And that which the locust has left has the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm has left has the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, 
all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouths. For a nation is come upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the cheek teeth of a great lion. He has laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He has made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. The words of Joel are much like those describing the beasts which devoured the flock of God in Isaiah chapter 56. This prophecy being a dual prophecy. While in Joel's day they were relevant to the forces which devoured ancient Israel, in these last days they are also relevant to the forces devouring modern Israel, the true people of God, the nations of Christendom, the white race, the remnant of the white race. Therefore, we see the punishment and destruction of post-captivity Israel in Isaiah as being at the hand of beasts, while in Joel it is described as being at the hands of locusts, caterpillars, palmer worms, and canker worms, Negroes, Mexicans, Arabs, Chinamen, makes sense to me, all because those who were supposedly watching over the flock were intoxicated instead. And that's the problem in both places, Isaiah and Joel. The watchmen were intoxicated. They were concerned with filling their own bellies. Now we shall examine the part of Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31 is related to the promise of the new covenant with Israel and Judah. However, to understand it, one must begin in Jeremiah chapter 30. To see that this is indeed a prophecy of the last days, it must be noted that Israel and most of Judah had been taken into captivity about a hundred years before Jeremiah wrote these words. Jeremiah chapter 30. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh saying, Thus speaketh Yahweh, God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith Yahweh, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that Yahweh spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith Yahweh, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even a time of Jacob's trouble but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith Yahweh of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve Yahweh their God and David their king, whom I raise up unto them. Israel's freedom from the strangers, from the aliens who have put him in this time of Jacob's trouble. Fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith Yahweh, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be in quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith Yahweh, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. 
We see later in the same chapter why these things are being done and a promise of recovery once again from Jeremiah 30, verse 15. Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity because thy sins were increased. I have done these things unto thee. Therefore all they that devour thee, those beasts of Isaiah, those beasts, canker worms, pommel worms, caterpillars and locusts of Joel, all they that devour thee shall be devoured, and all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity, and they that spoil thee shall be for spoil, and all that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith Yahweh, because they call thee an outcast, saying, this is Zion, whom no man seeks after. Jeremiah chapter 31 does not necessarily follow the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 30. Rather, Jeremiah chapter 31 parallels Jeremiah chapter 30. And this is fully evident where it begins with the words from verse 1. At the same time, saith Yahweh, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith Yahweh, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel. When I went to cause him to rest... Yahweh has appeared of old unto me, saying, Yeah, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee again. Again I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt be adorned with thy tabrets, and go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Then, following other visions of the gathering of those people who found grace in the wilderness referring to Israel in captivity, who returned to God in Christ, we read this from verse 27. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down, and to throw down, and to destroy, and to afflict. So will I watch over them, to build, and to plant, saith Yahweh. In those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eats the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. The prophecy which follows from Jeremiah 31, 31 is not a prophecy of the announcement of the gospel, but of its culmination. Because it says in verse 34 that they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No Yahweh. For they all shall know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Therefore, Jeremiah 31, 27 through 30, is a prophecy for the last days, the days leading up to the culmination of the promises in the gospel. The hope which follows thereafter is parallel to the time indicated in Joel, where Yahweh promises Israel, saying, Joel 3.23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in Yahweh your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, the prophecy of the Pentecost, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the later rain in the first month, the prophecy which we, the rain which we now await, the allegorical rain which we now await, the rain of the Spirit. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that a locust has eaten, the cankerworm, and the caterpillar, 
and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Yahweh controls even the works of the devil. He uses the devils to punish the children of Israel, just like he employed the Canaanites. He allowed the Canaanites to punish the children of Israel. And let me clarify that. The devils always want to destroy the children of Israel. The devils, the Canaanites, the Kenites, the mixed races, always want to destroy our Adamic race. That's all they have on their minds. There's 10 million videos on YouTube that prove that. There's 10 million niggers walking the streets of America that prove that. When Israel is obedient to Yahweh, the devils are prevented by Yahweh. When Israel is in sin, the leash is off. We have not the protection of our God. So, yes, in a way, he sent this great army among us. He allowed this to happen to us for our sin, as Yahweh told the children of Israel in Jeremiah chapter 30. Why criest thou for thine affliction? Thy sorrow is incurable for the multitude of thine iniquity. And therefore Israel would be devoured. Then in Jeremiah chapter 31, we see this time of trouble discovered somewhat differently where it says that, Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. In those days, they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. This prophecy must be parallel to the similar end-time prophecy of Isaiah 56, where it says, All ye beasts of the field come to devour all ye beasts of the forest, and the watchmen of Israel are held responsible for the carnage. They invited the beasts. And when we look at our modern history, governmental and ecclesiastical, political and ecclesiastical, we see that that is true. They invited the beasts for their own enrichment to fill their own bellies, just as we see in Isaiah chapter 56. We see, the, we see that in our own recent ecclesiastical and political history in all the white nations. Imagine that. Isaiah is a perfect prophecy of these things. To understand the sour grapes of Jeremiah 31, we should go back through Scripture and examine what, it made, what may be meant by that prophecy. In Ezekiel, it's clear, clearly used of men that sin. And he used that same analogy, I have to look it up because I don't have it ready. Ezekiel 18.2, what do you mean that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth have set on edge? So we see that the fathers eating the sour grapes is tied to the iniquity of the fathers. It's a sinful act to eat the sour grapes. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, we see that the children of Israel are chastised for having corrupted themselves, in verse 5, for having sacrificed unto devils, in verse 17. And therefore they were told in verse 32, for their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. 
The Apostle Peter also said to Simon Magus, as it is recorded in Acts chapter 8, verse 23, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Jeremiah chapter 31 is a prophecy of race mixing. And all those Israelites who accept the iniquity have eaten the sour grapes, the sour grapes of fornication. From Hosea chapter 4, verse 18. I'm sorry, verse 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Their drink is sour. They have committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with shame do love. We are overrun with these non-Adamic so-called races as a trial for our sins. Let me finish Hosea 4.18. For rulers with shame do love, give ye. In other words, they want. Trials for sin should turn us back to the laws of Yahweh our God. Those laws forbid race mixing. Yet, the denominational sects, the Baptists, the, Pro the, the Methodists, Lutherans, Catholics, whoever, and even those of our own number within Christian identity would instead have the children of Israel accept the bastard offspring which is resulting because our sons and daughters are being devoured by beasts. That's it, Don Spears, Eli James, Jeremy Visser. You're accepting the offspring of mixed-race marriages, bastard offspring, and you're teaching that as doctrine, or you're accepting it from others of your so-called colleagues? Yeah, you're doing real good. You're swallowing salad grapes by the bunches. From Deuteronomy chapter 28, from the curses of disobedience, this is, fits right in, dovetails with all these passages, the result of the disobedience of Israel, one of the items is, Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thy hand. We cannot stop this race mixing. That does not mean we should accept the iniquity. Rather, this is exactly why we are told to come out from among them and touch not the unclean, and Yahweh will receive us. When we see any of the so-called non-Adamic races in our lands, we should see them for exactly what the scriptures tell us they are. They are the beasts of Jeremiah 31. They are the beasts of Isaiah 56. They are the caterpillars, locusts, cankerworms, and pommel worms of Joel here to devour us for our sin. When we see these Arab bastards and these black bastards in our lands, knowing what Yahweh told us these people were in the old world, we should know that these Arab bastards, these Mongols, these Turks, all these Orient, so-called Orientals, Chinamen, squat monsters, chinkolators, whatever you want to call them, yellow squat monsters, these are the devils, the satyrs, the cormorants, the owls, the other unclean birds which inhabit our former Adamic world in Mesopotamia, the Middle East, Northern Africa, and now they're being brought into our new world, the nations of Christendom, by the millions. And we accept them as people, and we accept the bastard offspring when they devour our sons and our daughters. Hell no, we don't accept them as people. 
We write off our sons and our daughters as having been devoured by the flood of the serpent. That's what we do. We write them off, at least until they repent. If they repent, then they're the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter. If they don't repent, we write them off. They're dead so far as we're concerned. We don't accept our bastard grandchildren. When your daughter marries a, a Cherokee squat monster, we don't pervert the scripture and try to make them into a, into a man. It don't happen. He is a canker worm or a palmer worm or a beast. We don't pervert the word of God and try to squeeze him into the fold just because we have feelings for our squat monster granddaughter or our half-nigger son-in-law, Eli James. We suddenly start teaching, oh, God's going to accept bastards. These other so-called races are not, are not people, they're beasts. Canker worms, devils, and unclean birds. The scripture is, if, 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 let's put it this way. If these other so-called races are not beasts, canker worms, devils, and unclean birds, then the scripture is not true because there are no other ways to explain or interpret any of these prophecies. There's no other way to do it. Christ told the apostles that he saw Satan fall from heaven, and therefore through him we have power over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Serpents and scorpions. That, too, is how we should see the so-called people who are not sheep. They're serpents and scorpions. That's what they are. If you're not white, that's your category. You're a serpent, you're a scorpion, you're a devil, you're a satyr, you're a cormorant, you're an owl. There's no such thing as one-fourth devil. Sorry, it don't work. There's no such thing as 15% devil. Eli James, the clown, that said, well, if a white person is 85% white, and so a brethren had to correct him and tell him, well, then that person's not white. Because 85% is not white. 85% is a devil, a satyr, a cormorant, an owl, a serpent, a scorpion, a canker worm, a palmer worm, kind after kind. Here I'm compelled to repeat some of the things I said at the beginning of the Romans Part 6 presentation last night. And it's high time we did this. When are identity Christians going to stop accepting liars and clowns? When you see a liar or a clown who is promoting the idea that a bastard can enter the congregation of Yahweh, that anybody who's not 100% white can enter the congregation of Yahweh, turn that bastard off. He's not a pastor of Yahweh. He's not a purveyor of the truth. He's an infiltrator, and he's a liar. And he's, his, his agenda, his objective is to devour the sheep. When are identity Christians going to stand firm on the core issues of God and race, represented by the first two of the Ten Commandments? One puts his God first and honors his father and his mother by not race mixing. You race mix, you dishonor your father and your mother. You bring a little nigglet home, you've just urinated all over a hundred generations of your own ancestors. Yes, you have. Jacob honored Rebekah by marrying a wife of his own people. Esau dishonored his mother by taking Canaanite women for wives, and her heart was troubled for the daughters of Heth. Oh, that Rebecca was such a racist. Good for her. She said that if Jacob did like Esau did, her life would be worthless. 
Now, today, there are clowns calling themselves Christian identity pastors and telling you that you can accept the Esau's of the world, male and female, along with their bastard offspring? Wow. These are serpents and deceivers. This is not the word of God. That is the word of the enemy. You cannot accept bastards. You cannot accept fornicators. Put the wicked out from among you. In Revelation 2.14, in the message to the assembly of Pergamos, Yahshua Christ said, But I have a few things against you, because you have there those holding the teaching of Balaam. I'm sorry, that's the teaching of Eli James, right? Who had taught Balak to put his trap before the sons of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit fornication. Thusly you have also those holding the teaching of the Nicolaitans in like manner. Therefore repent, but if not, I will come to you quickly, and I shall make war with them with the sword of my mouth. Here it is, Don Spears. Teaching the children of Israel that they could commit fornication, that it's okay to have a little half Cherokee granddaughter. She'll be in the kingdom of God because we'll just go back in the King James Version and change the meaning of that word. Who the hell are you to be a King James only fanatic and change the meaning of one word in the King James Bible? You're a damned hypocrite. I'm not a King James only fanatic, of course. But if you believe that the King James Version is the inspired word of God, and then you want to advocate changing the meaning of a word to admit your little bastard granddaughter, you're a hypocrite. Because if you change the meaning of one word in the King James Version of the Bible, then you can't believe that it's the inspired word of God, you clown. That's the hypocrisy of these people who want to pervert and twist Christian identity. They want to twist it into just another Jew religion. That's what they want to do. From Revelation chapter 20, from the message to the assembly at Suatira. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. But I have against you that you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I have given her time in order that she would repent. Yet she did not wish to repent from her fornication. Behold, I cast her into a bed. And those committing adultery with her in the great tribulation, if they do not repent from her works, and I shall slay her children with death. Oh, this is Jesus talking. <laughs> He's not that mean Old Testament God. Jesus loves everybody. And I shall slay her children with death. And all of the assembly shall know that I am he who examines minds and hearts, and I shall give to each according to your works. Fornication is race mixing, as both the apostles Jude and Paul define it. Jude 7, 1 Corinthians 10 a two witnesses, the matter is established. Why is fornication so often associated with idolatry? Because Yahweh is only the God of Israel. He is not the God of other races. That is why when Judah married the Canaanite woman, he was said to have married the daughter of a strange God. The Pharisees disputed. The Pharisees disputing with Christ claimed that we all have one God. And the prophet Malachi says no. And Christ rejected their error, telling them that their father was not God. The devil was their father. So Yahshua Christ tells the fornicating Jezebel that I will slay her children with death. 
That Jezebel of the Revelation is not to be taken literally. It's an allegory. It's an allegory for Don Spears. It's an allegory for Eli James. It's an allegory for Geronimo Visser. It's an allegory for any pastor or anyone claiming to be a teacher of the Word of God who teaches his children to commit fornication and that it's okay. It's not okay. We do not accept bastards into the congregation. We do not accept the products of fornication. Jezebel in that passage represents every fornicator in Christendom. Her flesh was eaten by dogs, literally. And today's fornicators, they're being devoured by beasts, metaphorically. Don't think you're going to get God to accept the products of your fornication. You are deceiving yourself. Yahshua Christ will kill your children with death. You pretend to be a Christian. You're really nothing but a Jewish, humanist, egalitarian. Finding a back door to squeeze wolves in amongst the sheep. Thorns in amongst the wheat. Joshua is going to eliminate all of the bastards. As he said in Revelation chapter 2, as he also said in Matthew chapter 13, since bastards fall into the category of all things which offend in relation to the parable of the wheat and the tares. You see a mixed-race marriage, you see a woman with bastard children or a man with bastard children, you know that that's an Adamic person, perhaps an Israelite, who's been devoured by the beasts of Isaiah 56, who's been devoured by the beasts of Jeremiah chapter 31, or by the canker worms, pommel worms, locusts, and caterpillars of Joel chapter 1. You write them off and put them out of your company. And your eyes shall see it and grieve, but you won't be able to do a damn thing about it if they don't listen, if they refuse to repent. That's our punishment. That's our punishment in our sin, Deuteronomy 28.32. Next Saturday, we will continue this discussion with Revelation chapter 12, chapter 20, the flood of the serpent in history. The fate of all the nations surrounding the Israel of God today, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Psalm 137, Isaiah 13, and the fall of Babylon, Micah 4, Obadiah 15, and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Good fish, bad fish, wheat, tare, sheep, goats, and a lake of fire. That's where all of them end up. And all the bastards. And there is no doubt. Thank you for listening. Praise Yahweh, and good night. I'll be here Friday, the Epistle of Paul, Part 7.